Hello, and welcome to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Pretty much anytime we hear about tiger crime, whether it be poaching, consuming tiger parts, or owning pet tigers, an Asian country is to blame. We commonly see headlines that demonize China, Vietnam, Russia, and others for their known roles in wildlife crime. However, as shows like Tiger King and related spinoffs have demonstrated, the United States is a huge player in the illegal wildlife trade with a massive tiger problem of its own. Today, we are turning the lens and spotlighting Western countries' involvement in tiger crime. To teach us about this issue, in this episode, we're sitting down with Sarika Kanwilkar, founder of the nonprofit Wild Tiger, a PhD student at Columbia University, and a tiger expert. Sarika discovered her passion for tigers during an internship studying human tiger conflict in central India through TRACT, a well known tiger conservation organization led by her aunt and uncle. She returned to the US a changed woman and decided to dedicate her life to tiger conservation. In keeping with that theme, Sarika recently published a paper examining the U.S.'s role in the illegal trade of tiger parts, and oh my, is it interesting. Sarika teaches us all about the illegal tiger trade in the U.S., the conservation of wild tigers in India, and the actions we can take to protect this phenomenal cat. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that you can be alerted when the next episode drops. Also, follow the show on your favorite social media platform and engage with the podcast. I love it anytime I hear from one of you and we'll hopefully hear from you soon. <laughs> All right, everyone, here is my conversation with Sarika. Hi, Sarika. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and Oh, I can't wait to get into all the updates because you and I go back quite a long ways, which is amazing. And so to talk about your whole journey and everything you're doing for tigers is just going to be so fun. So let's introduce everybody to who you are. Let's take a trip down memory lane. Where does your story begin and how did you get to today? Um, well, first off, thank you, Brooke, for having me on your podcast. Um, it's been really fun to watch it grow from you just had your first year anniversary so yes. congratulations um and yeah I'm excited to to be here today so gosh my my story well I think it just uh starts with the love of science I guess in general um I always like had wanted to be a scientist then in college I studied and worked with a lot of endangered species and then after college, um, I got a BS in biology. And after college, I was like, I really actually wanted to work with sea turtles. Really? <laughs> For some reason, I was like dead set on working with sea turtles. So I was applying to like all the internships that like everybody wants, like in Florida and like on the beach, you know, it like sounded so romantic and everything and fun. Um, and I didn't get any. And so I was like really bummed, but then I started applying to like, kind of like different things and sort of going out of my comfort zone, so to say. Um, and then I got an internship with Jackson Wild, which is a film festival. And so that was really exciting. That was like, I did that for like six months and then, and that ended up actually being a really good, uh, you know, experience. I really... Uh, emphasize like getting a lot of diverse experiences for young conservationists because like what you're doing right now isn't something you have to do forever but anyways don't want to <laughs> sidetrack too much <laughs> um, but during that time I finally did find a field biology job so I kind of like was like okay I should probably give up on this like sea turtle dream for a little bit and like expand my horizons um just like I had tried, tried doing. And so then I actually, I still wasn't getting anything. Actually, I didn't try to expand my horizons. That's what happened. I still wasn't <laughs> getting it. I still wasn't getting a paid, you know, a paid mm. opportunity mm -hmm. in conservation. And I just like, I wasn't at the point, like I still had student debt. Like I was still at the point where like, I, I couldn't like volunteer, which a lot of opportunities were at, at that time. Right. 
as someone who has limited experience in wildlife, even someone who has like, I had research experience in undergrad with wildlife, but it, there's very limited opportunities. So anyways, and it's very predatory, you know, maybe that's been like a topic you've had on your podcast. before. I'm but. actually having one on very soon about exploitation of conservationists. So that is happening very soon to get very deep in that topic because I know I feel you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I wasn't getting things. So actually I have an aunt and an uncle who they've worked in central India for now, I guess over maybe a closing in on three decades for a long time they've worked in central India on tiger conservation and they have been world renowned and for some reason it wasn't until you know it was after by all my undergraduate was done that I even kind of thought of asking them to sort of like work with them and, and learn from them but anyway so that's kind of what happened so after I graduated um, I worked six months in sort of science education putting on a science film uh, sci a science festival not a film festival a science festival uh, and then after that I spent two months in Tadoba Antari Tiger Reserve and that's when I was sort of introduced to tiger conservation and their work. It's the work of Tiger Research and Conservation Trust. They're based in sort of Nagpur, India, which is the city, sort of where the office is. But they do work uh, all around Maharashtra, including Pench and Tadaba and Hari Tiger Reserve. Um, mainly. And, and so anyway, so that's when I was sort of introduced to tiger conservation. And so going in, I had the idea of like, I was very animal centric. So I was like, oh, yes, like the tiger, uh, a very, you know, Western perspective, and just thinking about the tiger. But when I got there, I actually, you know, the thing that you know, stood out to me, and, and I actually ended up loving the most was the people. So what their work on tiger conservation they they did some camera trapping of of tigers and monitoring them outside of the um, core of the tiger reserve but m actually most of their work that i helped with that at the time had to do with the conflict and so what they would do was interview people figure out like what was making people susceptible to attacks so whether it was that that person who got attacked themselves or their family so figuring out okay like what time of day is it what were they doing right and um so we were finding like a lot of women who were going out collecting firewood or um, a lot of the ones who were who were getting attacked right and that's kind of when i realized i mean first off going around to these villages is a really humbling experience for somebody anybody any outsider, right? And then understanding and, and hearing about how it actually is to live with tigers. It was such a reality check, like a slap in the face, like, oh, you've been so naive, you know, coming from the United States and like thinking only about the tigers when, you know, in reality, like, living with tigers and saving them is actually so much more complicated than just thinking about the tigers like we have to think about the people too and it's so much bigger than just the tigers so that experience really kind of uh i don't even know what, what is like a word a proper word to describe it it just changed my life it changed my life forever um, and that's when I kind of like knew I was like, I'm like built, I was like made for this. <laughs> and even though like this is, you know, ongoing and adapting thing, but yeah, I intend and will forever work in, in central India, like on, on tiger and, and conservation. So that's kind of when I found my calling, I guess. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, there's like so many things that just came to mind. First, I, I have to throw this out there just because the irony of what you just said. So one of my most recent guests, Brad Nahil, he is the co-founder and president of Sea Turtles, ironically, and his favorite species is tigers. And he ended up on the opposite direction and ending up with sea turtles. When like t tigers was this actual thing. Oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> and then you is literally the polar opposite. This is so funny that's I was like hard. are you serious how's that possible that you guys <laughs> oh, um, I mean it goes to show you I think a couple of things like one like to be like working in conservation like 
it's definitely like not about the species. Like you can never, I think, start with a species that's never going to work out. Also to wrap up that the sea turtle story for me, I actually ended up getting uh, for a year after I worked for my in India the, for the first time I got a internship working with sea turtles <laughs> so I did end up doing it but by then like like I said like I'd already experienced central India and there was just no turning back from that point oh well at least you had confirmation you know yes oh totally I'm yeah. so about that I'm so about that like right. actually in undergrad like I started out, I wanted to be a dentist. And so one summer I worked, uh, I did like a research project in uh, at the University of Pittsburgh Dental School. And it was like cool, I guess. But it, it again, it, it just like the experience itself really confirmed that like what I, that I didn't want to do it. Mm, good, good. Yeah. Sometimes I, I just, I love those examples because I feel like all of us have those moments where we were so excited for an opportunity and we're like, this is my path. And then you're like, oh my good God, this is not my path. And dealing with that emotionally and then just knowing that something mm -hmm. better is coming. I definitely had some of those moments in my path too, where I'm just like, well, my whole life just exploded and now I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. <laughs> so, well, I, I kind of feel like that happened for a lot of people over COVID too. Mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah. So yeah, I think a lot of people now are trying to grapple with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually out of hardship. That's like the next phase of life comes and it's almost always for the better, which is good in case you listening are going through something hard. Something better is on its way. We just don't know what it is yet. <laughs> So was this your first time to India, like at all or for family or so I would really love to, ex uh, to explore this experience for you because it completely changed your life. So was this your first time, you know, visiting just the conservation side or, or your, uh, yeah, just let's go, let's dive a little bit more to your connections to India. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, um, no, it wasn't my first time to India. I, the first time I was to India actually was when I was like six months old or something. <laughs> I don't remember, obviously, but it was my first time going alone, like without my parents. And I think that was a really growing experience in itself being at that age. And so when I had gone, I guess the time before that I had gone was when I graduated high school. So it had been four years and those, those are just like such transformative times. Right. And so from going to India, when I graduated high school, that's when I went to Tadova Tiger Reserve for the first time actually, and saw tigers for the first time in the wild, which was so cool, but it was also, it was like so hot. I mean, it gets really <laughs> hot in central India, you know, yes. I was like, yeah, this is cool. But like, I'm not coming back here. <laughs> uh, then look at me now. But, um, and, and then, but then through college, I sort of found that I wanted to work with endangered species. Right. And then sort of, then sort of like fell in love with it. So yeah, I just, when I came back for that time, like I was just, I was a transformed person for sure. So, so it wasn't my first time, but it felt like, you know, a, a first time in a sense. Mm. And it was the first time coming with a like conservation perspective, coming with like a more professional lens instead of like just experiencing a place just to experience it. And as just like family, I was experiencing it in a lot more. I was viewing it and taking in things and reflecting on things a lot differently than I normally had been. And so that was definitely a part of it. Mm. And I would say my family too is like a huge part of my sort of like love of central India too. I mean, my grandma, I'm really close to her. She's like my best friend. And because I wasn't really close to her when I was really young, because I grew up in, in the US and she was in India. 
But as I've gotten older and spent a lot more time in India, we spend a lot of time together. And so now I'm, I'm just really close to her. And so there's that. But then also my aunt and uncle, they, I learn uh, so much from them. They're really, they're the ones who inspired me actually to get my PhD, which I'm currently, currently getting. So they were the ones who really encouraged me to, to pursue that. And they continue to work in con tiger conservation as well. And then I have, uh, you know, a lot of cousins who are doing wildlife research across India and then are into like ecotourism and all of that. And, and then other, you know, uncles and aunts into nature photography. So, I mean, the list goes on. Like, I feel like everyone in my family there is connected to conservation and so it's really like a, a family effort and we have a lot of history there like my favorite thing is listening to the stories that uh, my grandma tells me of and and all of her sisters and it's stories of going on shikars basically which which are hunts right tiger hunts um, oh wow yeah because I mean historically like that you know there there's just like a rich history of sort of tiger hunting in, in India, like mostly even pre-colonial, but during colonial times. And so they, you know, I, and actually like villagers would come to my like great grandparents' house and like, be like, hey, like a tiger is, is attacking our livestock or, you know, conflict. Like the same conflict that happens today happened then. And a villager would come and be like, hey, will you kill this tiger for us? Right. And so then they would go and, and like shoot the tiger. And so my grandma, she wouldn't, they wouldn't take the, the kids, especially the women on, on the shikar itself, but they would, they would go on some shikars, whether it was like sort of like you know, bird hunting or, or just to go to the forest. Um, but they, they remember like my uh, great grandpa, you know, being paraded back through the village with the tiger, with, you know, garlands around his neck, being celebrated for killing the, the tiger that was harassing the villagers. Um, so it really was a celebration at that time. And you have to look at it from a historical perspective. Like, of course, like I, you would hate to see that today, but that was then. And um, so you can't really judge it by today's values. So, so that's like, I hear those stories. And then, but then like, as um, you know, India, India as a whole, as their laws and the way that they treated tigers changed in terms of conserving them became not shooting them, but protecting them, creating tiger reserves and saving them from the illegal wildlife trade. As you know, then, then my family too realized like, oh, let's, we, we can't hunt them. Let's like shoot them with the camera, not, not a gun, you know, sort of thing. And so, you know, everyone sort of shifted. And so I think like my family's own relationship with the tiger really reflects how the country itself has sort of evolved their relationship with the tiger. So anyways, so yeah, like Central India is, is really special to me in, in a lot of ways. That's incredible. I had no idea about any of that history. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, literally as far back as your family can recall, you have been attached to the tiger. That is totally yes. In your I call them, they're <laughs> yes. The ti tigers are like in my blood and yeah, I call it. Uh, we're a part of the tiger family. That's what I call us. Oh my gosh. So it's no wonder why you went there and had this great awakening. You're like, you are my animal. I it am, was you like, are me. <laughs> yeah. Like it was just like destiny. Like, I don't know. There's just like no other explanation. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we're soon going to dive into, it definitely was destiny. So six months have passed. You had this great awakening. You're like, this is what I want to do in my future. So I'm assuming now you come back to the United States. And then what did you do? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, gosh, my path has been all over the place. <laughs> so uh, yeah, for like a year, I worked in Florida on the Hope Sound National Wildlife Refuge. I was like a biology intern. So I did various things there. And I also got to work in the Everglades, which was really oh, fun. Oh, that's cool. I know. I got to, like my favorite experiences there were, I got to ride uh, helicopters to go do collect water 
samples in the Everglades. And so, and the helicopter had to land in, in the wetlands. And so it was on floaties. And so sometimes like one time we couldn't land because there was like an alligator there. <laughs> I'm like so I was like all in waiters you know sexy waiters and um like it was just like crazy like I was like what and an experience I never really pictured myself in you know but I just loved it and then also learning how to drive an airboat which was so fun um that's a cool they skill. don't have brakes like that's insane <laughs> that's insane this bit goes so fast <laughs> exactly like just like that fact should scare a lot of people um but they're so fun to drive they're so oh, fun so, gosh, dude, just like do it doing really like get doing really like I guess like the nitty gritty of land management was like super fun and it's hard work it's hard labor like people don't really understand I don't think like like managing land is just like super takes a lot of man and woman power, human yeah. power. so then but yeah so I did that for like a year and then I would I basically would go back to India like for a couple months every year um so then I think after that like as soon as my internship was done there I returned back to India and like worked for Tract for for a couple of months again and then I came back and worked for Jackson Wild again for the film festival because I was still interested in like I wanted to cultivate more of my sort of like science communication and science media and education skills as well because I did love like research and stuff but I also liked that the other stuff as well so and I love that organization. So it was just a fun place to work at. And that's like not a thing to, I've learned over time. That's like not a thing to discount, like a place mm. where you like to work is like really important. So anyways, so I also returned there. And then I think that's also when I sort of got more serious about getting into graduate school and realized that like, I, I mean, I kind of went through a, even though I feel like I'm youngish to the average age for graduate school when I started for some reason I felt like I was in a rush mm. like because I'd already been like a couple years out out of undergraduate you know and so I was like oh okay like now's the time like now's the time I'm supposed to like go back to graduate school you know I felt like it was like a now or never almost because I feel like I could have been like semi-successful in like other careers right and so like and then once you get comfortable in a place it's sort of it would just like be harder like I don't know yeah, yeah. so and and so I just I, I saw that happening so it became like I was like okay I have to get into like a good graduate program so I had to study for the GRE that really sucked I actually ended up like, I mean, I don't think like people should do this. And honestly, like I come from, I think it comes from a place of privilege that allowed me to do this, but I, I decided to, and, and my boss allowed me to do remote work. So I left Jackson where the film festival was, where my job was, and I moved in with my parents and then I worked remotely while I took classes to help me study for the GRE. Cause it'd been like a couple of years and since undergraduate and I kind of knew like my grades were pretty good in, in undergrad, but um, not like it wasn't a 4.0. So I was like, oh, like I've got to do good on this stupid GRE. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, by the way, my department now has doesn't even take the GRE. Nice. So, like, places have realized that it's no predictor of success. But anyways, so I got to do that. And, and, then, and then I was also, I was also very actually intimidated by... Columbia University because like the graduate school is all about the researcher right and so like I knew I wanted to work in central India obviously and was like pretty specific on I wanted to work on livelihoods and forest in a tiger conservation landscape which is central India so I was like really specific so like I had to like find somebody who does that and so then there was this person at Columbia University I was like Columbia oh my <laughs> god so I was like, I just was like, basically, I was just like, there's just like no way I'm getting in. And so that's kind of one of the reasons I like, 
I mean, well, she, so I work for Ruth DeFries and she, even like when I first talked to her, she was like, no, the GRE doesn't matter, but you have to take over admissions, you know? So, but like, anyways, it was just really intimidating. So it, like, I just like thought I had to study really hard for the GRE and stuff. And anyways, but so then I took it and sort of like put effort into, into graduate school. And during that time, I actually was a waitress at a like local pub in, in San Antonio, like where my parents live. And, and that's when I paid off my student loans. Woo. Mm. Um, go tips. Um, <laughs> Good and, for you. Yeah. And then the following fall, Oh, and then I spent the summer before graduate school. So that fall, I started graduate school. And then, but that summer before, I spent in northern Madhya Pradesh, which is in central India. And I worked on a leopard project with my cousin. Hi, your family. (laughs) But yeah, and so then then I started graduate school. And I've been, I started my my fifth year I'm mid fifth year now right now wow has it really been that long yeah I'm so old no you're not old I can't believe I just time is flying by way too fast I still remember when you got in I know and we need to go back we actually met (laughs) yeah we didn't even talk about when we met we met when I was working in, I think when I was working in Jackson at that time. So it must have been 2015 or 2016. Yeah, I was in my first apartment in Colorado and I moved to Colorado in 2015. So we, we had to have met in 2016. Yeah, 2016, it must have been. And yeah, I was doing a youth council for Wild Tiger, which basically I was just trying to, again, like this education stuff, it was kind of like, testing the waters and in, in we'll that. talk about wild tiger this amazing organization you put together just like oh my God. cliff noting this like <laughs> talk about it <laughs> uh the wild tiger so yeah wild tiger i started in 2015 so it is a 501c3 nonprofit based in the u.s um and basically after my so in 2014 was when, you know, I had sort of that life-changing moment in Central India. And um, 2015 is when I sort of formed Wild Tiger. And initially it was sort of, the basic idea was to help support Tract, which is the organization that I had been working for, working for in, in Central India. So that was the basic idea was to raise money in the United States to provide camera chops mainly to Tract. Um, and other equipment like boots and other things that the the staff needed and to do their work. <clears throat> and so that was the basic idea. And so that's kind of how when it started. And it's just it's evolved from there, I'll say. And then and now it's been, gosh, it's been a, a while now, I guess. It's still it's small. It's just mostly me and and my colleague slash friend Liz White, Felicita White, um, and then my parents. You know, we kind of like all have other jobs, but we do what we can, but it's like mainly, mainly me. (laughs) Um, And, and so, and yeah, my PhD sort of is separate from that. So it's definitely like, hasn't been in like a huge growth phase, but yeah, I, it's sort of like a part, I still continue to support now what we do mainly is I continue to support local organizations who work in central India. And, and one of the reasons that I think this is really important is that for me, the, like, there's a lot of, for, especially for international conservation, there's a lot of big international NGOs that you can donate to, but they have like really high admin costs. And, you know, there are questionable ethics involved, you know, in, in some of their work, not all, but anyways, you can be more, I think, uh, informed about where your money is going sometimes with more local um, and smaller organizations. And so that's what I kind of try and do is just connect people in the U.S. who want to help support really good conservation organizations in central India. I support, I I help connect um, people basically financially um, kind of that's like one way. Um, And then another, just like scientifically, like I'll go do trips and, you know, help camera trap or help analyze data or help in, in whatever way um, that people need. Basically COVID-19, you know, we did like a big fundraiser for people because that hit um, 
rural India pretty hard and the indigenous communities specifically. And so that was really great too. It was so sad to watch like that happening, like halfway across the world, because I was in the U.S. then. But working with an organization, the Last Wilderness Foundation, which works with like indigenous communities really closely around there, like they were, they were getting supplies, just like food, food in mass for, for the, them. And so it was like nice to sort of like, even though I'm halfway around the world that we all are, like we did, there was a way that we could like really help and make a positive impact. It, it was just providing money to them so that they could get food, you know, such a basic supply. So there's that and then the, the tiger trade research sort of and sort of like educating people just on tiger conservation in general. So that's what I use social media for mainly is just to spread the word about women in science, tiger conservation. I'd say that that's kind of like two things. And uh, yeah, tiger uh, trafficking around the world, but mostly uh, also focusing on the United States. So really excited this year, which is the year of the tiger. Um, I published an, a paper in conservation science and practice on patterns of legal and illegal tiger parts entering the United States. And so that was exciting to get, you know, a scientific publication out. And yeah, we intend to, you know, Wild Tiger will work, continue to work on sort of the more policy and impact side of those findings, as well as continue research in that area. Nice. Yes. So I was like, don't just, we got to talk about Wild Tiger. We need to get into this. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing so many amazing stuff with your organization. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, okay. So for me to understand this, would you say that your most recent paper that you published on the illegal wildlife trade, um, especially <clears throat> as it relates to the United States, is that part of your PhD? Because I know you're doing something very specific for, for your PhD. So is that more of this is my passion project? This is like a greater thing I want to do. So I want to put this paper out there. So where where did this research fall into like your grand scheme of things <laughs> yeah no it was it, it was kind of it's just like one of my varied interests i'm i'm definitely one of those people i'm not one of those people who like it's hard for me sometimes to find like a label for myself right like i sometimes i'm an ecologist sometimes i'm other things right <laughs> so because i just i do study a lot of different things like sustainable development or blah 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 which like so this, the research on tiger trafficking that like, like wild tiger just put out, that was separate from my PhD work. And so, cause the, and that work actually was, you know, based in the U S so my PhD work though, is all like place-based research. So it's based in central India. And so, yeah, that research is on forest health and forest livelihoods in central India. And so that's sort of inspired, um, from, you know, my, time in central India and, and realizing that tiger conservation is so much more than the animal. So I got way more interested in the sort of like people side of just like conservation and, and overall like landscape conservation. Um, so like landscapes is just, you know, I think I like thinking of things at that broader scale because it incorporates like it's thinking about things just out on a multiple parks you know, habitat corridors, cities, a, a level that incorporates sort of all the complexities that both like I hate, but I love, right? Like the, like just the people in, in Tigers, like how are they going to coexist in the future, you know? So like forests, just like the health of them and how they're changing, I think is really interesting in central India because on paper right now, India says it's increasing forest cover and that's mainly through plantations. But we all know that plantations are very, like they're limited in their benefits as compared to like the primary forest that was like probably cut. <laughs> to, you know and, and so there's like small scale changes that are happening to the forest um, and a lot of people live the way they live it's more conducive to those small scale changes so like in South America deforestation and changes to the forest mostly are a complete conversion of land cover that is like forest will turn into agriculture right 
But in Central India, that's just like not happening. What is happening though, is that people continue to depend on the forest for goods. So that's, they're entering for firewood, like every day, right? Like people like are cooking with firewood every day, mostly women and children, um, which is really bad for human health, but also is dangerous because uh, they, they run into tigers that can kill them. Um, <laughs> and then uh, there's that and then and grazing cattle right in the forest too and so all of these things have like huge impacts to the forest but like it's not like the forest doesn't like completely convert to a different land cover in in, within a year right so it's just like different so satellites have been like really good at measuring these like large scale landscape scale changes to forests like just around the world, but we are just exploring. That's what I'm interested in, right? Is exploring like how we can use satellites to to measure these more finer scale changes to to forests. And so that's like one of the things that I do as a part of my PhD is I use satellites, images, I use very high resolution satellite imagery and and free imagery like Landsat imagery to to see if I can measure basically um, and get at forest degradation, right? So I can basically see if I can produce maps um, and have produced maps of forest degradation in central India. Um, And then on top of that, the livelihood sort of getting back to like, sort of like how people are living in central India and specifically talking about firewood. Um, So to sort of combat the negative human health effects of firewood, the government of India has, has implemented this program since 2016, which provides like free LPG, which is liquefied petroleum gas, which is basically like the cylinders that people have in their barbecues, right? They they provide this as a clean cooking fuel in central India. So they'll get like a free cylinder and a free stove top. Um, but then they just have to buy refills and stuff. But then there's, but anyway, so there's this program that basically gives um, this away to like women um, of below poverty line households. Um, and so there's been a huge increase in um, in LPG ownership in central India. And we did a, I did a household study, a household questionnaire across 5,000 households um, across the landscape. Um, and we looked at sort of LPG ownership and how it changed firewood collection habits. Because a lot of what's happening, like there's kind of this model of that, like as people become richer, they just like change their fuel, the fuel that they use, right? They'll completely change it as they can like afford a cleaner energy. But actually what's mostly happening like in South America and Africa and in India is fuel stacking, which is where people are using multiple fuels to cook with. Um, And so we wanted to see if like even owning LPG, like does it like over time that that's what made our study a little different was we looked at sort of over time LPG ownership. How did it like change firewood collection habits? Um, and so anyway, so that's why it, it's important to look at sort of like how it changed firewood collection because um, people households are stacking, but um, it, like how, how basically how are they stacking like what does that look like so um, we did find like good results in the sense of like the longer households owned LPG, the less they were cooking with firewood. But there's still like a lot of unknowns about like, well, does that decrease then mean that there is a decrease effect on the health, right? In terms of the smoke is the thing that's like really dangerous. So like is the reduced amount of time that like firewood is being used for cooking, is that helping health in any way? Um, Or is it just like not enough, you know, not a big enough reduction. So, and then like uh, LPG too, I mean, lately the prices have increased. It is a fossil fuel. And so like the international community, the UN, the World Bank, like it is a clean cooking fuel, but like to a specific standard, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Um, But unfortunately like solar and like biogas and like dung, like cattle dung, like there's so many cattle in India, you know? Um, But these things just like haven't been able to scale 
And so that's sort of, I think like one of the issues, but yeah, so like livelihoods, sort of like energy and sort of sustainable development and forests sort of, that's all sort of like what I, what I do my PhD work on. Mm. Yeah. Sounds super fascinating. And I just love how this is a great example of while you're not exactly working directly with tigers in this phase of your, like on this particular part of your PhD, it's for tigers because to understand what conflict is happening with tigers, we need to understand what's happening with the people that live with them. And just as I've said multiple times on this podcast, conservation is people management. That is, that is what it is. It's almost never animal management. They got it. The animals are good. They're like, I'm just being and being awesome. It's more of how can we help people that live with them? And that is a fantastic example of how your PhD ended up going down this path instead of just being strictly just a tiger research. You know, like there's only so much we can know about tigers, which we will get into what you've discovered, especially regarding U.S. stuff. But I just well, think it's a great example. Yeah, no. And the, actually you bring up, a, I mean, another thing that, it's actually not officially a part of my PhD, but it started in my PhD also shows that, I mean, so yeah, I mean, I think like for me, everything is like at the core of things, very motivated by like tigers, but like at the same time, <clears throat> although people can argue that like you can't be that at once, but I'm also like not a tiger centric person. So, <laughs> so like I'm motivated, everything I do is motivated by the tiger, but like I'm not tiger centric, I promise. And because like one of the other projects that I do, um, I co-founded this uh, research collaborative called Project Devani with Pooja Choksi and Vijay Ramesh. So they're uh, also PhD students, but we basically use sound to answer ecological questions. And so like right now we're sort of focusing our work on more applied ecology. And so sort of using acoustics to determine the uh, effects of restoration, if that makes sense. Like whether restoration is sort of like bringing back the sounds of a like pristine forest so to say. So that's sort of like what we're focusing on as well as like, you can do so many cool things with sound. And so that's like been a lot of, that's all vocalizing species, obviously that that research like focuses on. Um, and tigers do vocalize. There is interesting actually research on that, but we're, what we do is on birds and insects and sort of like a more holistic look at just like the forest around India. We work in central India and the Western Ghats. But yeah, the Western Ghats and, and Central India, these places have tiger reserves right, right next to them. So that's why I'm interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, um, but yeah, like, so I think I, I am a dichotomy in that sense. And that like, I am, again, everything I do is like for the tiger, but like not everything I do is about the tiger. <laughs> Which, I mean, let's be honest, and I don't hope this doesn't become offensive in any way to anybody else that's listening that is very specific, like, very specific, is just look at the impact that you might have across your lifetime. If you're, like, livelihoods, is this actually working? These alternative fuel sources, are women and children being attacked less because they're not going in the forest as much, you know? soundscapes how is our biodiversity going how is our landscape going how's degradation going and it's like it's all of these different pillars essentially that you're doing for tigers because again conserving tiger doesn't mean one thing yeah just what keeping a population alive in one area over a span of time yes that's very important work but that's not the that's not the only question that we have and so you are answering so many different things at one time and who knows we're going to do in the future too you know like at this rate i think that's no i think that is definitely all the topics i can handle <laughs> those are the only <laughs> keywords i will be using from now on i promise <laughs> um no i mean the only reason i can do i feel like all of that is because of like the collaborations i've been oh. able to make i think that's like a huge part of it and yeah, I would say that's, that's big. And, and yeah, I think I'm really excited to see 
uh, I need to wrap up my PhD. Um, I'm hoping to finish in a year. And, and then I have an exciting project with Project Vani doing a more biocultural research in India. So I'm excited for that. That's kind of like field work that'll be on and off like the following year. But yeah, I'm excited to see like where that those research interests uh, continue. But yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I'll do, be doing anything else, but definitely, <laughs> yeah, like wildlife crime, livelihoods and forest health in central India. That's, you know, that's it. <laughs> um, but, but, but my wildlife crime interests, like obviously span international boundaries because that's a global issue that's a global thing so uh. and that is exactly where I want to go next so <laughs> I think it might just make more it's going to make most sense I think at least as the way I'm picturing it in my mind is we've talked so much about India so so let's start there with wild tigers okay what is going on or what do you think is going on or what have you discovered is going on from a wildlife crime perspective and wild tigers in India and then if we could branch out to maybe who some of the players are involved and and we're just going to take this full circle. But let's start with India. What, what's going on in India? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can start in India. We Let's start with wild tigers in India. So India, I mean, is... I'm not trying to oversell India. Maybe I am. But like, <laughs> it is the key place for tiger conservation because it has a majority of the world's tiger con like tigers left. And it has a lot of the sort of like global priority landscapes. So it, just, just because of the sheer numbers, like it's just such an important place for tiger conservation. And in like the pre nineties, there was like a tiger poaching crisis really driven by, I guess, I think skin, the demand for skins and medicines, of course, for uh, traditional Asian medicine, like all, mo most of all the parts of tigers have been used for that. And so Pre 90s, there's like two notable examples, uh, Sariska and Panna Tiger Reserve in India. Both of these reserves, all of the tigers were poached, were wiped out of these reserves. Like that's insane. <laughs> and so, uh, but then, but then after that happened, like things kind of like you know, people were like, mm, let's you know. <laughs> politicians and I think the public were like, you know, every we need to get our stuff together, you know, like we can't be letting this happen. So anyway, so then I think like the poaching crisis sort of declined, but I don't know, like honestly. And so over the years, over the past couple of years, like, I mean, so over the past decades, like counting tigers, the science of counting tigers has improved, but only in like scientifically, yes, but the actual like use of it has only improved in specific places. So I'd say India, the census there is done. Like there are still, what you say, like pushback about like the methods that they use. But overall, India does a pretty good job of using camera traps, which is like the most scientifically accurate way to count tigers, um, using that at, su at such a large scale that they have to, to basically like estimate their tiger population, right? But other countries like Russia does not use, they use pug marks to like estimate, um, to identify individual tigers and then estimate their population, which is really inaccurate. So you have to look at tiger population numbers like with a grain of salt. But anyways, so India's tiger population has like been increasing over the last like decade, I guess, or so. But like on anecdotally kind of, like I still hear like a lot of, of, of poaching basically. And it can be driven by different things, of course, like in India, it's a lot of, it can be a, like one, like electrocution, like whether that's like they intentionally killed a tiger that had killed their livestock or was like harming people, or they actually wanted an herbivore, they wanted to eat some meat. And then a tiger accidentally walked across this. Uh, so there's like accidental sort of like bycatch sort of, but there's like, there's also like purposeful because of conflict, but then there's for the trade in their parts. But it's also, it can be locally used, um, but also enter international markets, right? And so the thing is like, I just feel like anecdotally, I feel like there's a lot uh, more poaching happening than 
like people are willing to recognize because tigers are a really political animal and government governments and NGOs basically everyone has is incentivized to say like everything's going really great <laughs> tiger numbers are increasing and poaching is decreasing you know everyone involved in tiger conservation is, is is incentivized to do that that's in order to like maintain funding maintain clout whatever it is political stuff anyways the like the tiger is just so political so that's just like that's you know based on my own ground experience in central india okay uh, on what's happening currently but um but anyway so but you know tigers are just being poached continuously and like there was also just i guess from from india like we know through investigations on the ground that the number one destination is china for tigers that are poached from wild from from india and from like all tiger range countries. China is the number one destination. And also in Russia, actually research just came out um, in the Journal of Crime Science. Um, Alison Skidmore, she did a, um, she went undercover and to find out about more about poaching and like how it's done, right? And yeah, China is, is the number one destination. But of course, because they share a border, it's like easier. But yeah, so poaching is still like a big thing. I feel like I don't know, we have sort of stopped talking about it, but like it certainly has not stopped um, being a thing and even has like maybe even increased in terms of like, but like, so like measuring anything illegal is like super hard. Uh, so that includes illegal trade and poaching, but like as we're, we're seeing like more, we're seeing other like, crime enforcement organizations get serious about wildlife and for example like the UN Office of Drugs and Crime they recently like put out a report about wildlife trade and that's because most of the people who are involved in drug and human and weapons trafficking are also involved in wildlife trafficking because wildlife trafficking is basically the highest reward and lowest risk of all of those crimes and all of these transnational organizations they already have these routes that like work, whether that's like through corruption and they've bribed the right people specifically through these things to, to move goods, whatever, whatever. So if they opportunistically come across the chance to trade in other things, they will definitely do that, but not even just opportunistically. I mean, you know, mechanistically, these people are sort of like driving poaching of wildlife across, not just tigers, you know across species but anyway so so poaching um and just like wildlife crime it just like continues to be a really huge thing and i think in the broader scheme of things like just kind of zooming out of just tigers like we're living in an extinction crisis you know what i'm saying like driven by and like it's driven by all of these sort of what what i call like just sort of like I can't, I can't say the word, it's a bad word, but like big, ugly problems, I'll call them here. You the can podcast. say all the bad words. Okay. <laughs> it's just a big, ugly problem. So like, there's just like, it means like, there's not like one solution. It's like not very simple. It's like, it's just complex, right? And, um, and so like climate change and human wildlife conflict, and livelihoods for people who live around tiger habitat. Like all of these are like pretty big problems that are like gonna require a lot of like different moving parts and solutions, right? But like, to me, wildlife crime is just so, it uh, makes me sick to my stomach because it, it, it seems to be such a, it's not a simple solution obviously cause like it hasn't been addressed yet, but like it, in essence is such a simple solution just because it's driven by greed basically right it's just like so unnecessary that at least that that is driven by demand it just it's so unnecessary um that it's just like and driven by human greed so it just it it makes it like a a different thing to like fight in that way but yeah but poaching like i mean it, it definitely i recognize that like the 
people who are actually poaching the animals or like leading people to that and have that knowledge. Those are people who are experiencing poverty, very likely, but are also getting like the least amount of money from poaching, right? And and I think those problems like that in in terms of their motivation to be a part of that activity, that crime, that comes from uh, issues with livelihoods and like opportunities there. So that to me is like a really a bigger issue there. And like, so if there were opportunities, I just don't think those people would be a part of that, that crime. Right. And so it's really the, like the middlemen, the, the middle traffickers, but also, but mainly the end users who it's like, so it's just like, this is so unnecessary. Like you, there really is no reason. Um, that you need to be ingesting tiger parts or displaying them in your home. Um, yeah. So I didn't your... even, I forgot your, your question. No, no, that was so good. Rant. Oh, wow. I love rants because they just take us in places that we, I love to go down. So who, I get, who? So we know that China's a big player in this. Now, are they actually consuming things or are they just, is that where the main crime syndicates are and they're dispersing it around the world? Like, who is consu- who is demanding tiger parts? Where are yeah. they going? Um, God, I think that's like a good question, but okay. I mean, like, let me zoom out a little bit, but yeah, like China. So China is the number one destination for poached tigers, basically, right? But so my research that Wild Tiger just did was on tiger parts entering the U.S. And we also found that China was actually the number one export country. And export country is different than country in origin. And I can get a little more into that a little in, a little later. But basically, that means that China is either tigers from China or tigers that are moving through China from these uh, tiger range countries are then going to the US um, or other countries. Like there has also been sort of newer research um, about the European Union and and tiger trafficking there. And there's actually quite a bit of tiger trafficking activity happening in the European Union. And again, the number one export country is China. And so like China is, uh, you know, based on my research and what we just know about the global trade, they are not only the hub of consumers, but they are, are also the hub of, you know, the onward supply, so to say. So I can't say anything about specifically where the criminals are or anything. I think they're everywhere. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> they are oh my god um because that's kind of also what my research showed too is that like the consumers are also in the united states which i think is a sort of dun 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 moment because we blame asia for a lot of the consumption of wildlife and you know some of that i think was highlighted on some of the effects of like the COVID pandemic, right? When people like a lot of the Asian hate that came and and was inspired by that. So there's been a lot of blame of things, issues on Asia. And so, so, so on one hand, my research was like, dun, 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 but like people in the US are to blame as well. Um, But then also it flips the switch back to China and Asia sort of too. And then saying, but like, also you guys are like transiting and and shipping a a lot internationally. So like what's going on? Like you cannot say as a government, as a country that you're committed to tiger conservation. If you're shipping huge amounts of tiger parts illegally to the United States. Right. So it just brings into question, like a lot of the commitments and stuff. And so that, that, that's interesting. And yeah, I just think like globally, the trade is like a lot of the research and a lot of our work has focused on Asia, which makes sense because of historically, that's where the supply has been with like tiger range countries, but that's changed with captive tigers. And so like, China, Laos, uh, Vietnam, and Thailand are like the tiger farming countries. And it was like estimated that in like 2020, they had almost like 8,000 tigers that were 
Yeah. And there's only like less than 5,000 tigers left in the wild. So just in those tiger farms across Asia, there's that many tigers. And then, you know, in, in the U S you know, there's estimated to be like five to 10,000. So just because like having a wild tiger population doesn't really say anything about your potential supply just because of captive tigers and because most of them are like not regulated. Like they're not like the zoos bred for conservation type tigers. I'm in captivity. I'm talking about, I'm talking about pets and tigers that are bred by criminals. (laughs) Um, And so, um, or just by people who don't want to live in the legal world. And so where was I going with that? (laughs) So (laughs) captivity. So anyway, so um, like tiger crime in general, just, it's not, uh, I just, it's not, it's concentrated definitely in Asia, but it's not bound to Asia. And that's an important like distinction I think to make. And so, and our research just really like highlighted that. And I think like anecdotally people like kind of knew it's like, yeah, I mean, cause like research shows like the U S is a huge, it's like the world's second largest consumer, uh, demand market consumer of wildlife globally. So like anecdotally people like, no, but like, then what? There's like not a lot of action, like a lot of like the behavior change campaigns um, and interventions are like focused on Asia and we just like don't hear and maybe like we're just not hearing it, but there's just like not a lot of efforts on specifically on on, um, tiger demand um, in the U.S. But I think that also will require more research. Like, I think there needs to be a lot more like behavior change campaigns just in general in conservation. Like, we need to understand their efficiency and like really (laughs) make them the best that they can be. And in order to do that, we need to understand who who actually is the consumer, um, where actually are they, what are their actual choices when they're presented in terms of the price and everything? Because like I said, there's the market is so complicated because like you can get so many different types of products. They can be sourced either from the wild or captivity and all of these things. So all of this research needs to go into to like understand who is who is consuming these products. That's both in the US, but also I think internationally. And I love that we that this platform exists to talk about this because I've not had an opportunity to sit down and talk about tiger trade in the United States. Because from what I, from what we talked about last time, isn't it really hard to get any sort of data on what's actually real numbers of what's going on here? Right? Yeah. I mean, so our, I mean, so our study, there's both like, the U.S. and how it's sort of like playing with others internationally. And then there's like what's happening inside the U.S. And so my research was mainly on the U.S. with within the global community. And we were, our data was limited to 2012. And that was because of changes to FOIA and like how the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service released data. So the level of data we needed just like wasn't available to us. And so there's sort of that sort of, I guess, bureaucratic limitation to like having enough data. So for us, that was like one thing. And then just like within that, there's limitations of like, no, there were no exports recorded within the seizure database. Um, But obviously, like there's definitely like illegal wildlife getting exported from the United States. But you have to look at it from an enforcement point of view. And this goes with seizures are just biased by enforcement priorities. So enforcement officers, especially for that are working for the United States for like global security reasons. And we actually have a citation in our paper for this. For security reasons, they pay more attention to to the imports. And so so there's biases in in the data that we used, right? Um, And then the availability of the data was limited. And so that's like internationally, but uh, well, and then just, uh, I think going back to seizures, I mean, seizures are how we currently have come to understand a lot of 
specifically the tiger trade, I think there is a lot of like groundwork happening in Asia, I think on poaching and within China, I think on demand and stuff, I, there, there has been, but I think generally in order to find out like global patterns and stuff, we've focused a lot on using seizure data, but that is so biased. Again, it's so, it's just what you detect. It's what law enforcement has detected. And I mean, do you know how many illegal things I've done and never been caught? (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, think of that. Just, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but everyone listening to this has done something illegal and I hope you've gotten away with it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, But like, it just, you know, yeah, it's what gets caught. And so it's so biased. So even in like, I'll give you an example for like our findings, like most of the products that were coming into the United States were medicinal. And one that's not very, that's like sort of what we expected because um, like medicinal demand drives a lot of the trade. And, but then on the other hand, like medicines are like easy to transport, right? Easier to transport than like a skin or something. So just, it might be more feasible to transport that in, in, you know, into the U.S. or internationally, right? So that might be like a reason we're finding it more, or there's just so many things that could influence that. So I think there's just like, you know, to me, this paper was, I mean, partly it was about like the results about like, yeah, like what is coming into the U.S. and how much is it? But like the most shocking things were like one, just the scale of it. It was like, whoa, a lot of tiger parts are coming into the U.S. This is kind of crazy. And then two, like learning how much we still don't know and the like the limitations to what we like know. Because like, yeah, seizure data is so biased and that's really like the only thing we like, the only like data we use at like a global scale to like understand the trade and so I think there is a a lot of other things we need to like do um to like understand it more but so talking about like inside the United States and talking about like tiger trade and crime um so Sharon Gynup who is a co-author on the study that Wild Tiger just did she recently did work as an investigation as a part of her work with National Geographic on like the tigers in in the United States and she found like she did find a lot of sort of like trading of tigers and I think she used I think she used USDA what do you say like uh, records, yeah, USDA records. Um, she used USDA records, to sort of like look at captive tigers um, in the U.S. And I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's just like it's just kind of a mess because of like the lack of federal regulations, and and so I would say it's just it's again, it's just really hard to get data, like law enforcement data. I mean, like that kind of just shows you law enforcement stuff internally just again shows you that this stuff is present but you know it's just like again what's being caught but for example there was recently a guy who was shipping tiger and lion parts from New York sourcing tiger parts from Texas getting them to New York and then shipping them to Thailand and he was federally sentenced Doc Antle was recently charged um, with wildlife trafficking part of the reason Joe Exotic is in federal prison is for killing uh, tigers. And so there are, we're seeing more like instances and reports to sort of like have like more concrete evidence of tiger crime in the U in the United States, but there's just like so much more it like all the, the stuff that we've learned thus far is so surface level that it like just like raises more questions, I think, than anything. I just love that you brought up Joe Exotic and Doc Antle, because even though you and I absolutely despise the show, everything it stands for, I think it helped put this issue on a world stage, which there's that. I mean, I got through one episode just because I was speaking about it to on another podcast. And I that's that's literally all I could stomach was just one background episode. And I'm like, I'm going to literally oh, really? I can't I... do it. 
I couldn't do it. That happened to me second season because it got more into like, did you see the second season at all? Girl, no, I, I couldn't. Yeah, I'm sure you couldn't because you- <laughs> that happened to me second season. First season, I don't know. I was hella entertained. Even though I hated <laughs> it, I was so entertained. So I genuinely was entertained by it. But second season was a little more, they got more into the animal abuse part of things I think and so it was it was like a lot harder to stomach and also then they also did another spin-off like the Doc Antle story that was the worst thing to watch they said on camera they said like this former volunteer said that basically like she found a freezer with tiger cubs in it Yeah. And so not just like, I mean, for me, of course, like a freezer with tigers is like, you know, never sounds appealing, but to me, it's so beyond the like welfare and the initial disgust part of that. It goes, it's like, goes back to the conservation part. It's like, oh my God, what were you going to do with those cubs? Cause like, you were pro they're very high value parts sir like what were you going to do with those like obviously I mean maybe not so obvious but like obvious to me who thinks in that sort of way but like you just want to make money like you would sell them into the illegal trade and as my research has shown like with a lot of tiger parts entering the U.S. there is a there should be a concern for an ongoing demand for tiger parts in the United States. And given the, the high amount of highly poorly regulated captive tigers that are now in the United States, like why wouldn't they supply the, the demand that's here? Anyways, I mean, that's all just speculation, but you know, the fact that, I mean, the, I say it's speculation, but it's, it's like not <laughs> because all the facts are there, but, um, but again, it's like something illegal. So it's hard to like actually prove, but, but like having like that, this is something that I've been thinking about even pre tiger King, but then even watching tiger King, I was thinking of it, but then fi- having it like confirmed on like an episode of the spinoff of Tiger King, like a couple years later was like actually made my stomach hurt. I think I started, I definitely started crying, I think. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, It was just like, what? This is like, it just didn't even feel real to be honest. I was like, this, like what are we, what? The Matrix? Am I living in the Matrix? Get me out of here. Yeah, that was like an unreal moment. But so yeah, in terms of like captive tigers, um, there's just like, there's some states have, you know, it's like just like unlawful to sort of like own and breed a tiger, but some states like don't have any laws for that. So because of this mismatch of laws, you just have, it's really hard to find like, because there's no, if there's no law, there's no, like, illegal activity, you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> so, right. like, uh, so, like, if, again, so, if, like, no one's looking, it's just, no one's gonna find it, so, yeah, it just, like, there's so many questions. I love that you just brought up the legal part of this, because some of our listeners might have heard about the Big Cat Safety Act, and I would love if, could you go further into what this was and what happened with it? And did anything happen like positive? You know, you, you know what I mean? It's like- still happening. Oh my God. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's still happening. So it unfortunately, like, so I guess like being a part of, um, like conservation, I think like you have to start learning about like policy stuff. So I'm still learning a lot more about like federal policies and procedures here, right? Here and in India, um, because all of that pertains to conservation so much um, and so often. So anyways, so like last year was the end of the congressional session. So unfortunately the Big Cat Public Safety Act it had passed, I believe it was the House. Like either a law has to pass like um, one first, right? And then the second, and then it's like a law. But so I can't remember exactly which one it passed first, 
but it passed one, it was waiting to be voted on, but it wasn't voted on in time. And so then the congressional session ended, which means that it had to be reintroduced. It like kind of had a rebirth, right? But then at the beginning of this year, it was reintroduced into either the House or the Senate, one of them. And so right now it's it's currently sort of like making its way through there. It will be voted on there. I'm sure it will pass there. Um, and then it will have to be voted on again in, in the other House of Congress. And so now, so a congressional session is two years. So we basically have now less than two years to sort of get that passed. Um, and that's where it is, what it is. It's really important, Bill. I would say there's definitely like, I have things um, that I'll, I'll talk about in a second um, that I would add to it, but it's definitely like something that needs to happen and everyone should support. How you support it is contacting your members of Congress and letting them know that you care about it and want them to vote yes on its passage. But <clears throat> what it is, it's basically, it would make having pet tigers illegal. And um, having this as a federal law is like just so important for so many reasons. And do like making it illegal for the pet tiger is really important. And it, so it doesn't really um, get at the breeding directly in the sense of, so the reason why there's like so many tigers in the United States at this time is because there's an incentive for tiger breeders to like basically have a tiger mill because there's this thing, um, public contact can happen, but only with cubs. And so once a tiger turns 12 weeks, the USDA licenses people to have cub petting happen. But once a, a tiger turns 12 weeks, they aren't allowed to have public contact. But these operations, they make all of their money from cub petting. And so that's the incentive. Tourism basically is the incentive for them to continuously breed tigers to have tiger cubs. But it's really expensive to like have to have pet tiger. And so they offload, either they shoot and kill their tigers, which is what Joe Exotic did, like one of the reasons he is in federal prison now. Um, he shot and killed his tigers to like, you know, cut costs, make room for more tigers, uh, or you give it as a, you sell it as a pet to somebody. So this bill, like instead of directly going at like breeding and like outlawing breeding, it's going at the, the, um, the thing that's like driving sort of that, that cost offload from these breeders mostly. And so, so that would be great. And that gets at a lot of like the public safety issues with tigers, I mean, I don't know if, I don't think people are really aware, but there have been, like last year, there were several pet tigers that like escaped people's properties in Texas alone and like were roaming around the public. Like, okay. <laughs> so that's a huge public safety issue. So it gets at that. So, but then one of the, so that that's sort of like the thing. And I, I would totally urge everybody uh, email or call your, uh, representatives um, in Congress um, and tell them it's important for to you um, because the more people call like the message does get to them right their aides they do like take account into this um, and because of Tiger King like yes because of Tiger King like it did sort of like bring national attention to the Big Cat Public Safety Act but that's the only thing it did <laughs> um and so we'll see if that attention is enough right um if we can pass this act so they they do note down like what how many people like called about this thing so your call and email and stuff it really does like make a difference and it, it's just like so it needed to be adopted a, a while ago um and honestly it's been on the docket for a while and that's because it's an it's like been an animal welfare issue and i think the animal welfare aspect of tiger captivity uh, especially like in in not in, in facilities that are not accredited or managed is you know a huge welfare issue um but again like it's just it's bigger than that it it, it is affecting wild tigers when when it comes down to it and so that's sort of the the issue that that I bring bring with it. Um, and then and then one of the things is so with with the Big Cat Public Safety Act and with 
the regulations that need to go in place in the United States uh, and everywhere that actually have captive tigers. One of the things that like I want to see happening um, that is not a part of the Big Act Public Safety Act, but is is again something that needs to happen everywhere, but is only happening currently in Czech Republic and Thailand, is that all captive tigers like you know, they need to be managed and regulated. And a part of that should be giving genetic information to be a part of a captive tiger genetic database, right? And the reason that this is, is so that we can uh, monitor parts of, in the trade, right? Mostly, you know, get <clears throat> population level uh, information, population genetic information, and then uh, really be able to better manage tiger populations, basically. Oh, that would be absolutely incredible. If that, something like that, does it have a database of how many tigers there are, period? And then a for, in some sort of enforcement of following their life. And so, yeah, if a tiger just disappears, well, knock, knock. Where'd your tiger go? Yeah, um, well, that's one of the current problems now. So like for the USDA, who basically is the one who licenses people who um, like breed tigers, they are very understaffed and like kind of the, the records of people who breed tigers, like it's just like a spreadsheet. They don't even have like an image, which, you know, tigers, you can identify them with their stripes, like individually, like even an image would suffice. We don't even have to have their genetics to identify them individually if, if we have their skin, but genetics comes into play if, if they've been processed, right? Um, if it's a different part, but anyways, the, the skin itself, like that sounds simple enough, but yeah, no, it's just a spreadsheet that they have that basically like has like a count of the tigers that like has like gone in, in and out of their facility and whatnot. Basically what I'm saying is there's a lot of room for fraud <laughs> to happen. And that's exactly what happens. That's, that's exactly what happens. And there's just not a lot of management. And honestly, the thing that comes down to it is there is. I would say the debate is open about whether captive tigers are good for wild tigers or not. There are debates about like whether, whether they are not. The debate is open, but in the end, in the end, the CITES regulations, the international regulations, prohibits breeding tigers for the trade in their parts. So just talking about legally, it is illegal to, to you know, captively breed tigers for for their trade and so just in order we're we don't even have the like systems in place to be able to enact international agreements <laughs> about tiger conservation you know and i get it it is very intensive like the things i'm asking and i want to do they're not like it's not a snap of the finger, one person, like, it's not, you know, it's hard, it's not easy. But, I mean, they're tigers, they're high value species, and we've done a lot on the ground. And I think, of course, and, and, and that's, again, another point is that the whole point of using forensics and stuff is to aid the tigers on the ground. Basically, like, so, of course, you have the, I talked about making a database of captive tigers, but you also have, I mean, and there's already, we've, they, people have done fantastic research on tiger genetics, tigers in the wild, right? So we already have that information. It's just about sort of like collecting it and collaborating in a way on a political animal. <laughs> so who knows, but um, that information exists, but it's about pinpointing like where are these parts coming from to both aid enforcement, like in as real of time as possible, but aid enforcement, but also overcome, you know, uh, one, overcome the challenges of the limitations of seizure records, which currently is what we use to understand like trade. Cause like, then we can actually get at like country of origin and sort of source better. And also it, it bypasses, like when we use tools like this, we, you can bypass corruption. Um, so, and what I mean by that is like, we can, there's a limit to like what data, like what good data can do, but like, we can say like, no, like you're, we know that your captive tigers from your facility are like entering the trade. 
like because now we have the genetic evidence right and so so it's just like that that kind of evidence so i don't know it is it is definitely like a big um thing and i don't even know i wouldn't say i have a I, a good like grasp on like how it would be done too but it, it's definitely necessary i think it's like where it's where the field itself is is heading in general so which is super exciting and super nerve-wracking and like all the things like there's so many emotional layers to this which is good because that means we're starting to finally talk about it when when you know when, when emotions are stirred then normally people are put into action which i always love is action you just gave a very good point of contacting your local congressman contacting your senate whoever you can in government that has any authority to move this through and i they do listen they do listen i went and i spoke to um our congressman about the wolves before they got passed for a reintroduction in, in the colorado so um haley hawkins who's on the podcast like she helped mediate all that they do listen to you you can go book an appointment and you can talk about these things so couldn't agree more. I am definitely going to do that as well. I've done it before, but you know, like, as you said, next round, got to do it again. So outside of that, is there anything else that we can do as just people that want to get this stopped or help in some way? Is there another thing that we can do to help? Oh, yes. I mean, I guess like I would say the number one thing for international people, like if you're not, you know, in a capacity to like, actually work you know like go live on a near a tiger reserve and sort of where tigers are living and helping um a lot of people don't have that capacity or you're you know yeah you you don't have that capacity in several ways so uh if you are looking to help though like support financially organizations that are doing that work that are working on the ground giving um they're all of their money to the actual work that's happening on the ground and investing in communities and like livelihood opportunities and sort of like maintaining good relationships with people in these forested landscapes in these areas where tigers and other important wildlife are and that are sort of like monitoring that wildlife monitoring vegetation um and just doing all of the you know all of the various conservation work that go, goes on i'd say like find an uh, organization that's based in in a tiger range country so you know i like i know several really great organizations that i've met um during my work in central india so donate and financially support those organizations. And so that means like, so for within India, like people who are in there, I would say like, just donate and like contact those organizations directly. Um, but like one of the reasons I started Wild Tiger was so that people in the US could do, could make a tax deductible donation to, to Wild Tiger. And then we support those organizations, mostly with specific projects. So most of the fundraising that I do with Wild Tiger is will have like specific projects in mind mostly because of the way the way that i work right now um because it's sort of a, a side gig so to say um so it works better that way so it's like a project by project sort of support as of now but yeah so that's what i would say like really like do your do your due diligence of understanding like where your money is um whether that's like tiger conservation or any other conservation organization and yeah really i think like support local i think like we say that that's like a slogan for a lot of things i think like most used in like uh you know sustainable eating habits um so to say but like that also i think is how i try and live live my life lol live my life as a scientist ah that sounds so corny but it's true <laughs> and what i mean by that is like where your money goes like support a local organization like living where your wild animal is that you want to save and you know as a scientist work with local people and pay them a good wage <laughs> acknowledge um those people and yeah yeah there's there's a lot in, into that but but yeah so thinking local so supporting just like organizations who are doing like real good work so there's that and then 
you know, kind of a spinoff of that would be uh, sort of being a part of Wild Tiger. So that is just signing up for my newsletter. So going to the Wild Tiger website, that's um, www.wild-tiger.org, signing up for the newsletter. We really just send emails like twice a year, but keeping updated on our work, Um, And then also following me on like social media, that's like probably Instagram is like what I try and uh, update people on the most regularly. But yeah, I mean, I definitely, I'm trying to finish my PhD in in a year, but after that, I'll definitely be, um, and even now we're, we're, I'm looking to do more sort of policy impact with our most recent um, paper on U.S. tiger trade and yeah, even going forward, um, you'll get updates on, on everything through that. That is great. And of course we'll have all of those links in the show notes too. Cause you, everybody got to follow Sarika. Also her, your Instagram is so fun. Like it's just fun too. <laughs> you don't hold anything back. And I absolutely adore that about you. You're like, I'm feeling like this today. Here it is. <laughs> I love that. Totally. And then yeah. keeping us posted on what's going on, what you are seeing on the ground. When you do go, You finally, after COVID, finally get back to your field sites and what you see when you're in India and and your family and, of course, your grandmother. And I love seeing your pictures with her. She just looks so fun. Just, oh, I get so jealous. She is the best. Like, she has, she just is, like, so young, really, like, at heart. It's, like, crazy. Yeah, no, uh, thank you so much. That's, um, it'll be great to have all the info in the show notes. And, uh, yeah. Oh my gosh, Rika. Again, thank you so much for coming on and just sharing your amazing knowledge with us and having and giving us the privilege to maybe turn the lens on our own countries that since we're so good at blaming other places that maybe we need to start at home if we really want to save tigers. So again, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, no, thank you, Brooke, for having me. It's been a blast. And uh Yeah, I mean, I think I hope, you know, let's save the tigers. But, you know, remember, it's not always about the tigers, but it is always about the tigers. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So good. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.